the farthest north target northeast of Hanoi that we were allowed to hit. It was a railroad bridge. That target claimed a lot of American planes and pilots. Bamboo 2, you're on fire. Get out, get out, get out. When I got to the ground, I thought I was okay. But then I heard a shot. I just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. There was no place to go, no place to hide. So I was captured pretty quickly. I would only be able to give them my name and my rank and my service number and my date of birth. And so I went through the first rope torture that night. That started my uh, six years, nine months, and four days in the Hanoi Gulag. They were trying to keep us as isolated as possible. It was forbidden to whisper, to try to make any contact with anyone outside of your cell. My parents never received anything from me for the first three years. At one point, I was moved to the camp called Sante. That camp was the one which the Sante Raiders attacked. They tried to rescue us in November of 1970. Their, their raid was tactically successful, but strategically it was a failure because there were no Americans there at that moment. Major Dick Dutton, who was number three in the flight that day, he finished a tour. He came back to North Vietnam to do another tour. He got shot down and captured about a year and a half after I did. I managed to get close to a room where he was staying in uh, at Sante, and I asked him some things about the flight. And he said, yeah, your plane was just a big burning fireball. The fuel was all burning up all around you, and we were afraid you were burning up with it. He said, we were glad to see you shoot. And I said, did we get the bridge? And he said, yep, we got the bridge. <laughs> so anyway, that was a year and a half later. The camp that where we were situated at the time of the raid was about 15 miles from Sante. But we heard a lot of the activity that night we suspected that something big had happened, but we weren't sure what happened. Well, in a panic move, about three days after that raid, they closed all of their outlying camps and moved us back to the main prison in downtown Hanoi. And in order to do that, instead of having us isolated in individual uh, small cells with a maximum of four people to sell, they had to put us in big open bay rooms where there might be 40, 50, 60, 70 guys in one open bay prison cell. There were some guys that had known each other for two, three, four years, had tapped on the walls to each other, knew about each other, had communicated, but they'd never seen each other face to face. So in some respects, it almost had the atmosphere of a uh, high school class reunion or uh, a fraternity party. In May of 1972, we began to, uh, to sense that something might be moving toward a settlement. We are resuming the Paris talks with the firm expectation that productive talks leading to rapid progress will follow through all available channels. As far as we are concerned, the first order of business will be to get the enemy to halt his invasion of South Vietnam and to return the American prisoners of war. I believe it was around the 17th of May, they took about 200 of us and moved us up to a camp on the Chinese border. Even that far away, we could sometimes hear the rumblings of the B-52 aircraft. In November, uh, some of their propaganda during their attempted brainwashing sessions seemed to indicate that 
peace was at hand. We were always very cautious about anything we heard from them. And then one night they came and told us to get prepared, get our things all rolled up for a trip back to Hanoi the, the next day. And this time we noticed that when they put us, they arranged us uh, in rooms according to the date that we were captured, not according to rank or service or anything, which is one of the things we knew, we had always insisted on, and we knew our government would insist on, is that during the repatriation, the order in which we came home would be the order in which we were captured. 1973, January, was the year that the negotiations reached a final agreement in Paris. And in part of that agreement, for the first time ever, they opened all the prison cells at once, gathered us out in the courtyard, and the camp commander not only read the announcement, but each of us was given a personal copy of a, a, like an executive summary of the peace agreement and it, uh, it outlined approximately when we would come home. We were told that we were going to be fitted with a, a homecoming outfit. For all these years, we had been issued nothing but two pair of long pajamas and two pair of short sleeve pajamas, either barefoot or with these what we call the Ho Chi Minh sandals. They were like bath flip-flops, but they were made out of tire carcasses. But for the homecoming, they outfitted us in a, a windbreaker jacket, a, kind of a short sleeve sport shirt, slacks, socks, and leather shoes. And, and we actually looked pretty nice in those outfits, but the world didn't know. We'd only had those to wear for less than 24 hours. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's typical of the way propagandists try to make the best out, put on a good face, make a good show of everything, uh, in spite of the fact that they they treated us pretty miserably. I was there six years, nine months, and four days, and was released on the 12th of February of 1973. I was fortunate in many respects. One, I was had not been married. So many of the guys who were married had their wives leave them uh, and had gotten remarried. Those guys had a real tough time adjusting the first several days and several weeks home, you know, expecting to come back to a home and a family and not having their wives there to meet them. Uh, in some other cases, some wives were there to meet them but just hung on for maybe a few weeks or a few months and then got divorces. Some guys, even in solid marriages, came back to kids that they'd never seen. Kids that uh, maybe their wife was pregnant when they went to Southeast Asia. Some left home leaving a three or four or five month old kid come back to a seven or eight year old. So they made had a lot of adjustments to make that I didn't have to make but nonetheless, the, the shock at seeing so many of the things that had changed and had evolved was a culture shock. 
the design and the styles on automobiles and clothing and a lot of different things were so radically different. That was part of what we called the Rip Van Winkle effect, getting adjusted and getting used to things that we had missed because we'd been so isolated. You can imagine uh, being a fighter pilot is kind of like being a competitive professional sports athlete. If, if you had a, a, an injury or a, a problem that kept you on the bench for five or six years, during the prime years, uh, 24 to 32 is kind of the prime of life. In fact, some people say, how does it feel to have seven years amputated? And it, it, in a way, it, it's not an unfair comparison because when you have your prime years cut off and no way to get them back, there's all those experiences that other people were building up, serving in different capacities and doing different things. But I did feel like I was very fortunate to be able to do the things I did do. Because of my veteran status, uh, I was invited to participate with Camp V in the Rose City Air Fest, and I'm uh, honored to be one of the guests, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the air show. There's just something about uh, airplanes and folks, whether they're flying in formation or whether they're doing solo demonstrations, or showing off a single aircraft and what it can do. I always appreciate seeing the new developments in technology and the new training, but the motivation is always the same, and that is to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. In May 1966, during the war in Southeast Asia, while on a bombing mission in Northern Vietnam, then Lieutenant Ray was flying a F-105 fighter bomber that was severely damaged by anti-aircraft artillery. While he was able to complete the attack successfully and complete his mission, the aircraft was unrecoverable, forcing him to eject into hostile territory where he was forced into captivity. James remained a prisoner of war at the Hanoi Hilton for almost seven years. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce you to Colonel James Ray, United States Air Force, retired. The first night, I was captured. I went through several hours of rope torture. They were demanding to know what kind of military tactics, what were our targets that day, what were our targets gonna be for the next days and the next weeks. The main thing that I relied on was my understanding of our constitution. And all of us who serve in the military take an oath to defend the constitution of the United Amen. States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The United States really is unique because of two documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And the Declaration of Independence, the way it differs from every other government that ever preceded 1776, every previous government that ever existed in the history of, of population, of humanity, was authoritarian. They owned and controlled everything, but with the United States of America, it was the first time in history they said, 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. No country in the world had ever made that kind of declaration and then def defended it, and we've continued to defend that principle for over 250 years. That's what we've got to see continue. I've had opportunities to go back to visit Vietnam with different POW tour groups, but uh, I've never done it. It's, it you know, if I were in the Philippines or Thailand or somewhere close by, I probably would. Wouldn't mind going and seeing the places where I was and uh, had been held and even meeting some of the individuals. Wouldn't mind meeting some of those folks and even talking to some of the interrogators and. Uh, the guys that dealt with us day to day, I had wrestled quite a bit with the idea of what my attitude should be toward them, especially since Jesus taught us to love your enemies and uh, be good to those that are not being very good to you. And uh, so I learned to dissociate them from the system, the communist system. I could learn to hate communism without hating the individuals that were probably just doing what they were told to do. At one time when I was being tortured, a medic would come by occasionally, he'd push the door open and he looked in and I looked up and made eye contact with him and he kind of shook his head and then put his head down and turned and left. I thought I recognized a spark of humanity there, uh, and uh, it made it a little bit easier for me to separate the, the individuals from the communist system that were not being very good to us. And that kind of ties back to that poem, Invictus. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. So I've got the uh, responsibility to, to set a good example even when some other people are not setting a good example. That applies to directly to enemy combatants, just as it does with sometimes you, when you feel kind of betrayed or let down by people on your own side that want to take an easy way out rather than one that is more based on solid humanitarian principles or Judeo-Christian principles of loving your neighbor as you love yourself and being kind and doing good for those even that are being abusive to you. <laughs>